Hello. Um, let's start. And I will start with uh, repeating last slide uh, from previous lecture. Well, last lecture we went through LISA, now we're going to data analysis, and I do hope we will have 10, 15 minutes at the end to go through parts of timing array. At least I want to give you an idea what it is and what the main, how gravitational wave, what, what is the attempt and how we're trying to detect gravitational waves with parts of timing array. So uh, on this uh, slide, I just want to emphasize the main assumptions which went into likelihood. I hope I, I propagated the idea that much filtering is, uh, could be the best technique to use to search for gravitational wave signal of a known form. If you know how a signal looks like, that's probably you should have the use of this information and uh, try to dig the signal out of the noise. Likelihood, so for likelihood, uh, we're making first assumption that your data contains noise and the signal. And second uh, assumption goes uh, into the model for the signal. So here we assume that uh, our noise is Gaussian noise. I think uh, one of the slides, yes, I did. I showed you that noise is not necessarily Gaussian, but on some scales, actually, it is. And uh, that's the best what we can do right now. And for the special cases where this does not work, I will come to this as well, and I'll show you what can be done. So right. So what likelihood tells us if you uh, subtract signal exactly from data, what you should be left with is a noise. You don't know parameters of your signal, and therefore you're trying to subtract many what we call templates. And I also use different letters H. S stands for the signal, but H I'm using as the waveform model. It's our model, and uh, I will call it template or waveform, uh, jumping between these two words. Um, and the key point also here is this inner product. This inner product, well, it's actually it is inner product. Uh, it is a product between data and, uh, and the template. It's a correlation. And we also introduce the weights of the inside this correlation to show that our detector is not sensitive equally at different frequencies. So in other words, variance of a noise at different frequency could be quite different. In case of uh, LIGO Virgo or LISA, it is higher at low, very low frequencies and at very high frequencies, and the best is somewhere in the middle. Yes, please. Why is noise is there's no coupling with noise frequencies? There is no coupling between noise frequencies. No, it's basically our assumption. If there is a coupling between frequencies, but it's very weak usually, and we ignore that. Um, right, so. What you're trying to do uh, to estimate the parameters, one of the way is to uh, minimize the likelihood. So you're varying parameters of your template, you subtract it from the data and see which parameters maximizing likelihood. And uh, this estimator of these parameters, this frequentist approach in, uh, the, in the detection of gravitational, oh, sorry, in general, in the detection of the signal in the noise, and this estimate which maximizes your likelihood called maximum likelihood estimator. It's not necessarily equal to true parameters of the signal which was in the data, and the reason for this is, uh, could be several. Well, the main reason is that uh, noise corrupts your signal, and therefore it's uh, slightly changing its shape, and, uh, um, and therefore what you're recovering not necessarily will be true parameters. How close it is so these parameters or to true parameters, how close your maximum likelihood estimator to true ones depends on the, how strong your signal, how much actually noise could influence your signal. So the stronger signal, the closer this estimator to the true value. And also it's unbiased estimator in the meaning that if you take the same signal but many different realization of the noise and you average your estimator of the, over the noise realizations, it, uh, it tends to, to true value of the signal. Of course, quite often in our measurements, we don't have many realizations. We have to deal with one, and well, well, that's what you get. And I want to bring one more point. That's one of the reasons why I put different letter. So it is, it, actually it is true. What we're using is not uh, in the modeling gravitational wave signal. It is a model, so it, is, it has some inaccuracy. How big or how small, this is a big question. And what we actually, our model gravitational wave signal is not necessarily a true gravitational wave signal. Even numerical relativity waveform, it has some intrinsic error due to numerical methods. It's the best what we can get, but nevertheless, 
It's not necessarily true. So when it, uh, when it is not true, you can ask your question, what are the parameters which are minimizing correlation? Or let's say in this sense, uh, uh, imagine that you have data without noise, just a signal, and you're trying to maximize likelihood. In other words, you're minimizing this quantity, and you can get the parameters which are bringing H as close as possible to S. And the difference between true parameter and what you have found from your estimate, um, that's called bias. So this is uh, because you have inaccuracy in your, in your model, and uh, the best estimate of your parameters might not necessarily will be true, but you know, with some shift. And I want to not one, uh, emphasize one point that this bias does not depend on signal to noise ratio, whereas this error does. And uh, at some point, for instance, for LISA, signals are very strong with signal to noise ratio thousands. Okay, this error might dominate your ability to estimate accurately parameter, or for instance, making uh, tests of general relativity because your model is not accurate enough. Nevertheless, even if you have bias, it might not prevent you from detecting gravitational wave signal. So that's what is called effectualness. You might uh, create model or template which looks like a true signal, but on expense of the bias. So you might uh, use different parameters, and for different parameters, it looks closer to the true signal. And uh, that's what is called effectualness, and it's actually used a lot for the, for the search. If you really want to ask question how similar your uh, model, gravitational wave model, or any model of your signal to the signal, we introduce faithfulness, where you compute your model at the two parameters, and you compare with something, well, we don't have real signal in a way without noise, but you can compare it, let's say, to numerical relativity data, to model which obtained to the best of our abilities to, to model gravitational wave signal, solving Einstein equations exactly numerically. Um, so here you can see I put in denominator something and that's what uh, makes template normalized. And usually this quantity is called also overlap. I just want to introduce the jargon. I will, might not use it, but nevertheless. So if you read papers, you understand what the faithfulness, what is overlap. So overlap is uh, computed between, uh, let's say, signal or one model and another model. And uh, the booth normalized, so overlap varies between minus one and one. One means perfect match, basically they call completely align, and the minus one, it means that you forgot to sign somewhere. Um, yes, and it's usually related to the loss in signal to noise ratio. So if, you're, um, if you don't model very well, you also start losing, uh, if your effectualness is low, you might lose in the signal to noise ratio, of course. And you try to model as good as possible, and a lot of effort goes there. Now, uh, as, as I said, to estimate, uh, to have maximum likelihood estimator of the parameters, what you want to do is maximize your likelihood, and uh, usually um, you have many parameters, so it's a large parameter space. And how to do that, one of the, the most easiest way is to cover your parameter space with a grid, with a mesh of points and ND, uh, and uh, you want all the points to be on equal distance from each other. And this grid, uh, it's like a fish net, right? If it's too coarse, you will lose fish. You will lose your signal, you will not find it. If your grid is too fine, then uh, you start losing in your efficiency. So you need to compute uh, correlation of your data. You need to compute likelihood at each point of the grid. And if it's too fine, you're doing way too many uh, calculations, and you might wait uh, weeks, years, months, in order to get the uh, idea whether there is signal there or not. So it's interplay. You have to decide and choose what is tolerable level of coarseness and uh, how much of the signal you, want, you might tolerate to lose. And the distance between the points on this grid is not a coordinate distance because we already introduced inner product, which hints, which is measure of correlation between <coughs> signals. So distance, in our case, is also measure of correlation between points in the parameter space. And let's introduce this distance, this distance square. Uh, I 
think this should be square here, but it doesn't matter. So it's uh, basically a measure of the distance between the two uh, templates, uh, normalized templates and the nearby points in the parameter space. You can, uh, this is the definition of this distance, square, basically this inner product which we introduced earlier. And you can, because uh, the deviation of this parameter is small, you can use Taylor expansion and you will get this result. And if you compare and if you look at the interval in, the, uh, in geometry, this geometrical approach, you can associate this with a metric in your parameter space. So what you want to place your templates on equal distance to this one, not in the equal distance of your parameters. Because uh, there is a metric which governs actually the distance. So this is in a way interval proper distance between the uh, points in the parameter space which tells you how much different points are correlated. Um, let's look, let's take one point, let's look at the two-dimensional parameter space. I'm not specifying what parameters are there. And it's really just a cartoon. We choose a point in this parameter space here and we fix this uh, distance uh, from this point to any other points in this sense to be a quite small value. And we place all the templates which are at the distance no more than this one from this point, and they usually form some kind of ellipse in 2D or hyper ellipse in the ND. And this is what we will call the volume of a template. So basically anything uh, with this precision anything falling in there will have quite high correlation with this template. And so you want to place your ellipses by, by first of all, you need to choose what, you, what is tolerable DS, distance between points in, the, in your grid. And then there is the, the, those ellipses will be everywhere. And the ellipse, it's um, shape, so size and the angle, how much it's rotated, is a function of your point in the parameter space. So, Ellipse here will be this form. Ellipse somewhere here might have different shape and uh, completely different shape. And in the ellipse, there are two the principal directions. This direction is direction of strong correlation. It means that uh, uh, to get signal which is or template uncorrelated with this one, you need to go quite far in this direction. And this direction of the strong correlation, so even small shift in the parameter, in this parameter, will make your two templates, two waveforms, unrecognizable and non-correlated with correlation close to zero. For instance, uh, in M1, M2, such a parameter here will be chirp mass. Chirp mass is a very sensitive parameter. That's what we measure the best. And even small change in chirp mass will modify uh, your gravitational wave signal quite a lot, its shape. You can see it by eye. But for instance, other direction could be a spin of the black holes. Uh, waveform, um, gravitational wave signal, rather weakly depends on the spin, and so you need to change the spin quite significantly in order to have a waveform which is quite, looks quite different. And different or similar we measure by using correlation or this inner product as we discussed here. And here is an example of the grid points which are used in the analysis in uh, uh, mass one, mass two. And as you see, there is a very densely populated uh, areas at the small masses and uh, <clears throat> large mass ratio. Those are signals which have many, many cycles in, this, uh, in the frequency band of LIGO Virgo. And therefore, changing parameter a little bit will change number of cycles quite a lot. And therefore, you need a very fine grid of the points to cover it. If you're going to high masses, this equal mass line and that's actually a template which triggered detection of uh, very first gravitational wave signal. And this little circle there. You see the number of points there is quite small. Uh, those are heavy masses. Uh, they, the signal in uh, LIGO Virgo band, it's only about 15, 20 cycles before it merger. So it's a very short signal. And uh, therefore, it's in a way, a slight change in the parameter does not change the the signal drastically, and therefore you need a fewer number of points in this region. Is that clear? So this is actually a method is used uh, to search for gravitational wave signal 
what we call online uh, with low latency so that you know we start to have it's like a quick look to get uh, candidates for gravitational wave signal for further um, investigation later. And uh, this quite efficient method, uh, despite there are so many points, uh, it, it can run very fast. Now imagine that you have candidate or you have gravitational wave detection. You want to look a bit closer at the data. And here we're switching from uh, frequentist analysis to Bayesian analysis. Bayesian analysis is very computationally expensive, and there, because uh, LIGO Virgo data is uh, terabytes of uh, data, it's uh, very hard to apply to each chunk of data separately or on a whole data at all. It's impossible. And therefore, it's applied to the uh, small parts of the data where the, we have identified the candidates for gravitational wave signal from the previous grid based analysis. You know, there is something with high likelihood. You want to look at this part of the data a bit closer. The key point of Bayesian analysis is uh, it's quite different treatment. If frequentists we were saying there is a signal given by God and uh, um, it's just corrupted and we're trying to do our best to estimate its parameters, here it's quite different uh, uh, philosophy. Here we're saying, well, we will treat parameters of, of our signal as a random variables. And we're trying to estimate distribution of this parameter based on the data. But before you start looking at the data, you need to ask yourself, what the prior knowledge you have, what can you say about uh, these parameters or model, even the model? Um, and you have to apply this uh, prior before you start looking at the data. So this pi, I always will refer to the prior. You can apply prior to your model, and you might have several models you want to try. It could be models within general relativity if black holes have spins or no spinning. If spins are orthogonal to the orbital plane or they have arbitrary orientation, it could be more general uh, models, general relativity versus some other model which in, uh, introduces deviation from general relativity. And you're trying to, uh, first you need to start assigning some prior to this. Then you look at the data. This is uh, your likelihood. That data updates your knowledge, your prior knowledge. And you get a posterior. So for the model selection, you want to estimate this thing. Probability of the model i given the data. And uh, usually, not always, but it's very common that a model will be parameterized by some set of parameters. Here, i index refers to the model, and vector refers that it could be n-dimensional parameter space. Okay. And for given model, we can again apply a Bayesian theorem, you have a prior attached to the parameters. It's quite important thing. If you don't know what it is, you should use probably non-informative prior. For instance, you don't know where your gravitational wave source on the sky, so you might uh, put uh, uniform on the sky prior. But if you have some information, like for neutron stars, for, in, for, for instance, you know that masses of neutron stars should be between one and roughly three solar mass. You should use that information in your search for uh, binary neutral stars. You always have some information about prior. You always, it might be non-informative prior, so going from minus infinity to plus infinity in the, in the worst case, but even there it's very rare when it goes from minus to plus infinity. You always have some bounds coming from somewhere. Yes, your posterior depends on your prior, and it depends on your prior knowledge. So you make you have to to deal with this. Uh, some people think it's a weakness of Bayesian approach. Some people think it's a strength of Bayesian approach. It's uh, yes, it's uh, you updating your prior information, and my prior information might be different from your prior information, and you might get different answers. But this is uh, encoded in this theory. This is the, the the idea of this theory. It must be like this. That's what it says. This is basically likelihood, and likelihood tells you um, kind of likelihood of the observing data D given model MI and set of parameters within this model theta. And you get posterior. The numerator here and there play a role of the normalization factors. And here it's plays not only normalization factor, but it also stays here. 
So this is called evidence, evidence of model M, I. You can play this game with different models and this is very important uh, parameter. This basically will tell you how likely uh, one or another model given the data you are looking at. So what you want to estimate is um, this probability of the data given the model I. And uh, this is uh, basically marginalized um, posterior over all the parameters. So yes, this is your posterior and it's marginalized over all the parameters. And this probability of model I given the data. Okay, it's given by this formula. Basically I have rewritten here doesn't want these two formulas. Um, so quite often we want to answer this question and it's uh, by far non trivial because there is a normalization factor. So it's very hard to get absolute value for this because to know P of D, probability of the data, you should have a complete set of models and it's very hard to have them. So uh, quite often a uh, set of models actually even continues and uh, it goes, it's all, almost infinite set. So in order to avoid this problem, uh, computation of PD here, people introduce what is called odd ratio. It's a ratio of the probabilities of model A over model B given the observational data. So that we, we avoid, uh, we don't know the absolute values of this, but we can say which one is more likely ratio of probabilities. And ratio of probabilities given by ratio of evidence, that's what's called base factor, this expression, evidence of model MI, and uh, ratio of your prior odds. So if you believe that one model is more likely than others before you even analyze the data, you should use this. Often it put to one saying why would I analyze the data if I prefer one over other. Um, but nevertheless, you should use, if you have some prior uh, information about uh, that one model could be more preferred, you should use it here. But as I said, usually people put this equal to one and they concentrate on base factor. So what we want to obtain is, uh, what do we want to obtain? We want to obtain evidence if you want to do model selection, if you want to test several models and see which of these models are better supported by data. And we also want to get the posterior. What posterior tells us is, uh, do I have it here? Yes, posterior here, evidence there. Posterior tells us for a given model, so you choose a model, <coughs> you have a set of parameters, and you have the distribution of the parameters. This tells you, uh, given the, your prior knowledge about distribution of parameters, what you think it could be, Data will tell you whether you're right, wrong, if it's, uh, or it tells you nothing, basically. It could, your posterior in some parameters could reproduce the, the prior. But in, in any case, you want to have this probability distribution function for your parameters given the observations. This tells you everything. If you want maximum likelihood, if you want maximum posterior, if you want mean value, medium value, this basically distribution. All the information contained there. If you want to get point estimator like mean value, you can compute it. If you want median value, you can compute it. But uh, once you have this, you, you, it's up to you what to choose. I will very briefly will tell you about a specific way of computing this posterior called Markov chain Monte Carlo approach. And I'll very briefly introduce a specific way of uh, making Markov chain Monte Carlo. I'm not going into details, very just idea throwing at you. So we, can, we want to construct Markov chain. Markov chain is a stochastic process where the, pre, the next point of the chain has the knowledge only about previous points in the chain but not about any others. And we want to construct such a Markov chain which moves in the direction of the uh, maximum likelihood. That's what uh, this formula tells us. Um, and we want to introduce transitional probabilities, so the way of moving from one point to another. So if you start with one point, we need to understand how to move from this point to the next points in the parameter space. So this is a chain which moves in your parameter space. And we want this chain to move in the direction predominantly of maximum likelihood. 
And we want this uh, transitional probability, the way to move from one point to another, to satisfy a very specific balance equation. These are transitional probability, and there is a P, sorry, I used the same letter, probably I should have used different one, but here is a conditional probability, here is not. This is the distribution you want to sample. In our case, it's a posterior. It is this distribution we want to sample. So your transitional probability must satisfy this equation. If it does, then theorem tells us that after some time, your chain starts drawing points from the desired distribution P, in our case, of posterior. So one of the important points is to construct this transitional probability which satisfies this balance equation. And one way of doing it was suggested by two statisticians, Metropolis and Hastings. Uh, first, it was raised by Metropolis, and Hastings extended this. And uh, yes, what they're saying, well, let's introduce first uh, what they call proposal distribution. It's a proposal distribution. It's completely in your hands. It's completely arbitrary. It's a way of jumping from one point to another. It could be Gaussian, it could be uniform, it could be anything you want. Uh, the key point that your end result does not depend on what you use here. And then we build the chain by introducing the acceptance rate probability, this alpha. So acceptance probability going from uh, theta k to theta k plus one. k here, index of the chain. Imagine the chain, and now it's all, you know, it moves in parameter space. And it's a minimum between one and this ratio. And this ratio is what is called Metropolis-Hastings ratio. And it contains three parts. One is a ratio of priors. If your prior is uniform, that it's one. If it's non-uniform, you have to take care of it. The next uh, term is a ratio of proposals, which you have adopted here. It's in your hands. <clears throat> it could be symmetric or not, so probability going from k to k plus one or from k plus one to back to k could be equal. Exa easy example is uniform. Um, then this ratio is equal to one, but your proposal could be complicated enough, so it's not one. And of course, you want to, to move in the direction of the maximum likelihood. So this uh, ratio of the likelihood is one of the most important term in this ratio. So for instance, if this uniform, this uniform, what it tells us, of course, it's not good proposals uniform, but nevertheless, let's just assume for a second, um, then uh, if next point has li higher likelihood, so this ratio is above one, you always accept this point. Probability of acceptance of this point is one. If it is less than one, then you compute this quantity alpha, and you might accept or reject it, but uh, you accept it with probability alpha. What does it mean? So imagine that this number is uh, less than one. In practice, you're drawing another number. Give me a name. Beta, beta, let's, let, let's call it beta. Uh, uniform from zero to one. And you compare your alpha with this uniformly drawn number beta. If alpha is larger than beta, you accept the point. If alpha is less than beta, you reject this point. Okay? And so for, and you start with a random point in your parameter space and you build the chain. Okay. Um, I mentioned that uh, your end result does not uh, depend on the proposal distribution. Nevertheless, the efficiency of your algorithm depends a lot on this proposal distribution Q. So ideally, your Q must be equal to what you what, to your answer. So it's chicken and egg problem. So to get a good proposal, you need to know your answer, okay? To get your answer, you need to suggest proposal. So if you have good guess, you should use it. If not, you can try several of them and we see which works better or which works worse. I want to give you an example of this taken from one of the book, Bayesian books. Um, the chain is trying to sample here a Gaussian distribution with a sigma, I think, one. And this is a good chain. So basically, you start with some random point. It was not the best point. It's wandered a little bit. And after some point, you see it's pretty good sampling of the Gaussian distribution. 
Now, what happened if you use uh, the proposal, also Gaussian distribution, but here it was sigma 1, but you, you choose sigma variance of your Gaussian proposal, 0 0.001, very tiny. You will find that each time you're trying the point, it's accepted. You're trying the point, it's accepted. And you might be happy saying, oh, great, my chain is moving. But actually, if you look at this, it does, it does move, but variance, actual variance, is uh, defined by this one. So it will take a lot of time to explore, to go to this edge and then back. In other words, in mathematical words, it says that, yes, you have long chain, many, many members in the chain, but all your points are highly correlated, extremely highly correlated. And to check that, you can look at the autocorrelation length. What is autocorrelation? It's uh, you take the data, you multiply with itself. This is zero lag, and usually it's normalized to one. This autocorrelation here. And then you shift by one point and see how similar the data after shift to itself. Two points, three points, four points, six points, et cetera, et cetera. And you do it, uh, shifting, keep shifting it, and you're plotting this, uh, this product of shifted data with itself as a function of your shift, of your lag. And for instance, the black curve saying that actually after only 10, 20 shifts, data is completely different. And the red curve tells you even at uh, two, 300 points, data uh, still have self-similarity. It means that your points in your chain are correlated, quite similar to each other. So, and then the question here, how many actually independent points you have here? So you might have million points, but if you have autocorrelation length 1,000 points, it means that every 1,000 points in your chain is actually uncorrelated and makes sense. So here you're spending a lot of time calculating likelihood and it becomes not very efficient. Other example is when you're trying to make a proposal with high variance. Let's say that the variance was here one, but you're asking uh, variance to be 10 or 20. What happens there is that you're trying next points, it overshoots your, your posterior and it's rejected. It's rejected at each step. And it stays basically for a long time at one point until it finds by chance something better. So again, this rejection rate is very high. So the rate of accepted point in your chain, very small. What I want to say here is, uh, yes, your end result will not depend on your proposal distribution. But to get a good chain at the end, the good sampling of your posterior distribution, you might need to wait years. So theorem does work, but it doesn't tell you how long you have to wait. So efficiency, a lot of, the, a lot of effort is put into constructing the proposal distribution, which, which gives you good sampling rate, good acceptance rate, and uh, well, you see what I'm saying. Uh, another pro problem is if your um, if your posterior is multimodal, so there are several maxima in your posterior. This is also quite problematic because chain usually goes into the direction of maximum, and it might get stuck in one of the maximum. It has probability non-zero to go down, cross the big valley, and find another maximum. However, for this to happen, you might again wait for Hubble time. And there are other techniques which modify slightly the, the, uh, how your chain behaves, like simulated annealing, parallel tempering. I'm not going to tell you to talk about this at all. But uh, you need to take care. The simple one will not really work properly if you have multimodal posterior distribution. That's what I want to say. You need to use extra tricks. They are known, uh, but nevertheless. So at the end, you will have uh, samples from your posterior. So it's a numerical probability distribution function. It's not analytic, it's numerical. You basically sampling from unknown distribution given the data. So let's look at a quick movie. It's a wrong movie, but nevertheless, it might give you an idea. So there is a data there, there is a template, and they're trying to fit a, a template or waveform into the data. So first there is a fit in the distance. So distance uh, gives you scaling and amplitude. Then there is a, they're trying to fit a mass. Mass tells you how um, stretched or compressed your signal is. And at the end, you adjust other parameters. 
It is wrong in the meaning that it is not done like that one direction at the time. It's usually done simultaneously, but this gives you roughly ideas that some parameters are responsible for the amplitude, some other responsible for the, for the phase, and uh, yeah, you can use this. So what at the end you will get is, uh, again, if you remember at last lectures, I showed you maximum likelihood estimation of the gravitational wave signal. It was single line which fit in the data. In reality, when you have a posterior distribution for each posterior distribution of your parameter set, you can compute a line here. And at the end, you have a, not a single line, but rather broad line, which encapsulates the um, this, uh, possible, all possible parameters which signal could have. So it has finite width. You can see it finite width here. Or you can uh, draw it in terms of the indeed uh, posterior distribution function for your parameters. In particular here, there are two parameters given here, chi effective and chi p. I will not go into details what is each of them. I'm just tell you, so if this is uh, L, this is orbital plane, two bodies, and if spins uh, arbitrary, let's call it M1, S1. Chi effective corresponds to combination of the spins projected on the S parallel, let's call it. These components parallel or to the L or orthogonal to the orbital plane. Chi effective is other, it's combination of other components which are constructed of is perpendicular. One, two. And uh, chi p is uh, one, two. Okay. Um, usually, these components determine better from gravitational wave data rather than that one. And this is uh, encoded here, and that's why I wanted to show you this plot. So, you see this little green line over there, and here, this thin line, this is prior. This is what you used as your prior knowledge. And then you applied your search on the data and data told you, well, actually didn't tell you much about this parameter. The posterior almost reproduces your prior. It means that data doesn't have any additional information to what you already knew. For this parameter, data actually gave you different answer, okay? That was your prior knowledge. And the posterior, as you see, is much more confined in the parameter space. Moreover, it tells you that most likely value of chi effective is negative. It means that this component of your spin most likely looking underneath the orbital plane. Okay? And just example that sometimes data could tell you new information, sometimes it, it actually doesn't. Uh, well, let's look, have a look at the other few examples of parameter estimation. Um, there are three, uh, I will consider it only on two signals here. One is the very first gravitational wave event. Uh, this is frequency representation of this signal. The width corresponds to uncertainty in parameters. You can see that we have a little bit of in spiral here. There is a merger here, and it all happens in, within the quite the most sensitive part of the band. For other signal, it is this one. It's longish in time. It's also propagated quite further in frequency. And the merger happens where noise already rising, so there is not much merger we can see. And uh, this heavier mass, this lighter mass. And let's look at the parameter M1, M2, how well we can estimate them. So for this signal, it is this contrast there. There is similar contrast for another signal which is not shown there. But nevertheless, what I want to say is quite symmetric. This line is an equal mass line, so you can flip it over, you know, this total reflection. It's your convention, you're saying M1 equal to M1 larger than M2. And this one uh, corresponds to this event, and you see banana shape. So why is that? Why for one signal we can measure, you know, rather nice ellipse, for other we see this banana shape. It comes because for this signal over there, we see a lot of in spiral, this part, and a little bit of merger. So we see this part of the signal, 
and we hardly see anything here. For other signal, we see a little bit of uh, in spiral and the merger. And the key point here, if you see only in spiral, it depends heavily, you know, the best measured parameters I told you is chirp mass. If you don't see the merger, what you're measuring is this in spiral part, you're measuring chirp mass very well. If you see merger as well, merger depends on the total mass, M1 plus M2. It's a different combination of the masses. If you measure both of them, you start breaking the degeneracy and you can measure individual masses. And that's what's happening here. Here you see merger, so you see in spiral a little bit and merger, and that's regular shape. Here you see a lot of in spiral and hardly ever, uh, just a little bit of merger, you have this banana shape. An extreme example is the neutron stars. This really line of equal chirp mass. Because there you see only in spiral. Okay, so knowledge of, the, of, the, of your source and the gravitational wave signal helps you to already predict what you could expect in your parameter estimation. This could be used as your prior, for instance. Um, a little bit about neutron stars. So these uh, uh, black holes which were detected, these uh, purple circles are black holes known from X-ray binaries. And I will talk now a little bit, just a little bit about this binary neutron star merger. Um, for those guys, they have finite size, they all have finite size, but nevertheless, they're deformable. Yeah. What was the first question? Prior yes, prior on the masses. For neutron stars, actually, it's between one and three. It was a bit extended beyond three and below one. But in principle, you do, would expect that below one, you would rather form a white dwarf, and above three, you should form black hole. So in a way, for this binary, uh, they were extended, okay, below one and uh, up to five, I think, in uh, in the search, but the, the, what you got at the end is uh, it's support only really for what you can see here. And for the black hole, is uh, So, for black holes, it's, it is uniform, yes. It's uniform in the mass ratio and in chirp mass in some sense, but it's, uh, yes, you don't put, it, whatever it corresponds to in masses, so you, you usually use chirp mass or total mass and mass ratio uniform in these parameters. Now, why you measuring well one parameter or another? It really depends on your gravitational wave signal. So, for instance, chirp mass, I think I already mentioned this, this enters at leading order, it's a Newtonian order in your phasing. We are extremely phase sensitive to the phase of gravitational wave signal. And that's why this parameter we measure the best. Mass ratio comes later on, and therefore it's uh, not as well determined. You're still determining it, but not uh, very well. Otherwise, you would have exactly the line. Here, nevertheless, it has a width. Uh, about spins, the same story. Leading order comes projection spin orbital term. So it's an inner product between L and S. And uh, this component comes at a higher order, which is spin-spin coupling, through spin-spin coupling. And so it's really hierarchy of the V over C hierarchy as they enter the phase of gravitational wave signal. Of course, when it comes to the merger, thing, uh, things change, and you might hope that you know, some of this degeneracy is broken and some effects will be stronger, but you know, if they were weak in the beginning, they, they become stronger, but not as strong in some sense. Yes, and for neutron stars, one of the ideas, which uh, I think that was one of the questions during the discussion session, uh, about the equation of state. So, equation of state enters the gravitational wave signal through deformability parameter and what is called usually lambda 1 and lambda 2. So, you, from the equation of state, you can derive um, this universality relation, I love Q, um, of Q, uh, of lab number and uh, equation of state. So basically what I want to say is that they enter 
in the Yes, in the waveform through this parameter of deformability parameter lambda 1 and lambda 2, and that's the thing which we can measure or try to measure. <coughs> they enter at very high post-Newtonian order. Nevertheless, for a neutron star, you have many, many cycles, and this tiny effect propagates and gets accumulated, and uh, uh, as you see, it does, it's not very well measured, so there's this blue spread that tells you how accurately you can measure it. Nevertheless, you can say something. And you can, so one of the, well, you can constrain from this side, and you can rule out some equation of state for neutron stars. Uh, so this direction makes neutron star less compact, this more compact. This is black hole, so zero, zero is a black hole, remember this. And one of the questions was, can we actually rule out black hole, black hole? So we know that if this system is neutron star only based on the masses. We know that black hole should have heavier mass. But nevertheless, can I, one could ask, who knows, maybe it was primordial black holes uh, or something else, you know, not from the stars. <coughs> yes, you see electromagnetic counterpart, but can you just say from gravitational wave data? Yes and no. If you assume that these two stars, let's call them still neutron stars, have weak rotation, and weak in the meaning that, well, it's still fast, but uh, not very fast. Um, so all the neutron stars, all the pulses which we see, they're not very strongly rotators, okay? They're, they're rather rotating not very fast. If you make this assumption, then you can rule out zero. So you can rule out black hole, black hole solution, black hole, black hole equation of state. If you assume that, you know, with unusual neutron stars and uh, they can rotate very fast, then unfortunately, uh, you cannot rule out zero, zero solution. That's the story. So based on your prior knowledge, you get different answers. And the question is now what you believe more. A um, few words more about spins. Uh, so the spins could give us a clue how these uh, black holes, these four black holes, were formed. And uh, very briefly, it's again what is shown here. This semisphere is for heavy body and lighter body. And it's shown spin. So how far, what we're looking here at the dark spots, okay? These are more likely, um, these two-dimensional probability distribution function. And two-dimensional, one parameter is the magnitude of the spin, so it's, it's uh, the further away from the zero means the higher spin of the black hole is. And angular distribution will tell us how well the spin is aligned with respect to the orbital angular momentum. So zero here would correspond to its perfect alignment. Pi there would correspond to anti-alignment. 90 degrees means the spin lies completely in orbital plane. And I just want to show the zoo of what we got so far. There is no uniform answer to what we see now. The very first event, first of all, shows that most likely spin was weak, and we have no clue how it was oriented. For uh, Boxing Day event, actually we see that the spin is rather significant. So we could exclude uh, values below 0.2. Orientation is a bit harder. There is a dark spot here, but nevertheless, as you see, there is still a lot of support for the spin to be uh, orthogonal to the orbital plane. For this event, it's a January event. Story is different. There is more support underneath of the plane. So it means uh, spin of the heavy body most likely was pointing underneath there. But where exactly, it's again very hard to say. It could be completely anti-aligned or it could be somewhere in, in this area. So it's a three completely different systems. Constitutionality. So we were lucky to see binary neutron star. It was very loud signal, but in one of the detectors in Livingston, we had this. This is a huge glitch. And it happened just right in the middle of the signal. So what do you do there? Throw away the data? No, well, you shouldn't. One of the easy way is just simply apply the window, which is uh, cut out this part of the, of the data, and you try to use the rest. 
just throw away part of the data. Or you can rethink and reconstruct your likelihood function and say, now my uh, data model is gravitational wave signal, which you can see here, is a chirp, there's a frequency, there's time, and it's, you see rising in frequency. Gaussian noise plus that thing. And uh, so basically you take into account this non-stationarity into your likelihood model in the model of your noise. And you're trying to model this, and in a way, because if you remember, likelihood is based on the data minus noise minus age. So if you put your noise as a Gaussian plus glitch, in a way, effectively, this part removes this thing from the data. And you can try to feed this simultaneously with your signal. It was partially done. Uh, there was analysis of the data plus uh, noise, Gaussian noise plus a glitch, and it was removed, but it was not done exactly properly. It was done first like that, and then like this. You see, first the glitch was removed, and then data was reanalyzed. The problem is this, your glitch removal software will remove also part of the signal. In a way, you need to put everything in to do it. I just want to say that if your data is non-stationary, you want to modify probably model of your data, model of your noise, and you can do it again properly. Now I want to say a few words about testing general relativity. There were a lot of questions about massive graviton. Um, I've already, I think, answered several times. The main effect which uh, used to search for a modification uh, of uh, gravity due to mass of graviton is by dispersion. So we're looking at the propagation effect that uh, different frequency of gravitational wave signals propagate with different speed. The high frequency propagate faster, the low frequency propagate uh, slower. And uh, you can try to use this effect. You can modify your waveform, your model, to take into account this effect and then you search for it. And what, you will, what data tells you, it basically says, well, I don't see much, but nevertheless, because you don't see much, and at some point you should see it, it can tell you about upper limit on the mass of graviton or lower limit on the Compton wavelength associated with this. So this is your posterior, basically saying anything above this is so large that uh, we are not sensitive to it. And anything uh, above this, we would be able to see, but we don't see it. Is it clear? In other uh, tests which are performed, actually almost all the tests which are performed are consistency tests, because we don't have complete waveform gravitational wave signal in uh, non-GR theory. And, uh, you can construct phenomenological deviations from general relativity and trying to search or constrain them. Uh, but otherwise, so everything what is done, let's modify GR this way with some maybe motivation and search for these deviations. Does data support uh, non-zero deviations or not? Quite often zero is well within the <laughs> posterior distribution which you get. And uh, then you can say that, yeah, well, my data is consi consistent with GR. It doesn't uh, prove that it's uh, consistent with something else because, in a way, we don't have something else. But so far, we can say it's consistent with GR. Or you can, uh, well, this one of the example, you can split your signal in two parts, this yellow part, which is in spiral, pre-merger, and the green part, which is merger and post-merger. You can try to estimate parameters of gravitational wave signal from each part independently. Uh, and then compare them with, with each other and with the parameters you got from the full signal. And that's what is shown here. So the yellow part gives you this dark dashed line called in spiral. The green part of the signal gives you something, this uh, purple semi-dashed line. So you see they have quite good region of overlap. This projected into two parameters, final mass and final spin of a black hole after it's being formed. And I think Vitor next week tells you more about this, how to compute those things. And it also overlaps with the, parameter, with, the, with the posterior distribution which you get from the full signal. So it's again a consistency test. You're just checking whether different parts of your signal is consistent with each other. 
within Jia and Jia. That's all what I want to say about uh, data analysis. Other questions here? So I have time, it's very good. I will switch to password timing array. Otherwise. So spins entering, uh, yeah, spins entering uh, in two ways. Um, they're entering in the phase formula, and for instance, the easy example would be if spins are aligned, this configuration, the waveform will be longer, and signal will be stronger. So for the same masses, if you have spins aligned like that, the signal will be stronger and longer. It's encoded into phase, basically you'll have additional cycles there. If it's uh, anti-aligned, you can guess that the signal will be shorter and weaker. That's uh, the easiest I mean, example to, to tell you that actually spins entering the, uh, the phase and uh, the defined number of, for instance, of cycles which a gravitational wave signal spans in the band. If you have precession, you know, the additional effect would be modulation of the whole signal. So your signal will not look like, uh, I will show you the envelope. Okay, that's your usual one, you know, here. But it will look more like, um, and uh, And there are oscillations in between. So this second effect through, through which you can see the effect of the spins, especially if there is uh, this orthogonal component. Well, there are oscillations here, but it's just amplitude. How amplitude behaves? And no, it's uh, yeah, yes. Basically, it depends. This uh, modulation depends on the component of the spin in the, in the orbital plane. Okay, pass the timing? Good. Um, what is the main idea about uh, pulsar timing? So if you remember for Lisa, I told you about that in principle when we looked at the single arm response, that uh, theoretically we have, we need only one arm to measure a gravitational wave signal. But we cannot do that because there is a noise and main source of the noise is a laser frequency noise. It's not stable, frequency fluctuates so much that we were never would be able to, uh, to see gravitational wave signal and that's why we need several arms and interferometry to cancel this noise. Now I'm coming to pulsar timing, I'm say, saying, okay, here we do have one arm. So we have pulsar in one end, and pulsar here works as a clock. Tick, tack, tick, tack, and it's sending these ticks and tacks to us. I'll tell you about how it does. At very regular intervals, very stable, okay? And these ticks and tacks, they propagate these uh, electromagnetic waves. It's not laser, it's radio pulses, and they propagate in the gravitational wave field, so the blue and red shifted, and uh, so at the end we receive ticks and tacks with our, our irregular intervals. That's the basic idea. Now instead of one arm, you have many of them, each pulsar can be seen as a, each arm. And uh, there is no laser, as I said, there is a radio signal, and it's traveling in only in one direction. So it's a nature provided detector over for gravitational waves. I will go a little bit more into details, but the basic principle is this. Um, the range for which pulsar timing is sensitive is in the nanohertz band between 10 to minus 9 and 10 to minus 7 hertz. A bit, few words about the pulsars. So those are neutron stars. If you have a star with a mass more than several, seven solar mass, but let's say less than about 20, at the end of its evolution, it will explode and create neutron star. Neutron star, when it's created, it has very strong magnetic field and fast rotation. Then it's losing its rotation through the emission of uh, various radiation. A lot of radiation comes from the 
magnetic poles. Uh, for us, uh, the one which is important is radio emission. So there is a radio beam coming from the polar, magnetic polar regions. And when it swaps across line of sight, it's like lighthouse, you see the pulse. Pulse, pulse, etc. So it's a nothing pulse. Okay? And those pulses, here, uh, basically, I showed here. That's the very first pulse which was discovered. It's really like lighthouse. Um, yes, what we need is not just normal pulses, we need millisecond pulses. Why? Because they have extremely stable period of rotation. They're very good clocks. The pulsar clock, so the stability of their you know, clock based on the pulsar, better than terrestrial standards on a long-term scale. On a short time, it's the losing, but on a, on, a, on a scale of 10, 20 years, they're more stable. Uh, what is, uh, why they're so stable? Those are actually all pulsars. They quite often, this uh, usual diagram call, showed, called PP, the PP dot diagram, this period of the pulses, this uh, derivative of the period of the pulses, and all millisecond pulses are usually here, and majority of them in binary systems. There are some of them which are not. Uh, if you want, I can tell you later, you ask me, I'll tell you why they're not in binaries. Um, and the mechanism how they were produced, so old and uh, fast spinning, is because they were indeed in binary at some point, at least at some point maybe they're still in the binary, and they moved a bit faster than its companion, and they started accreting the mass. So they were taking, uh, dragging the gas from its companion, from the star, and uh, uh, forming a little accretion disk, and the falling gas donated its angular momentum to the neutron star, making faster, faster, faster. And that's why it's, at the end we have very old, very boring neutron star, with still quite strong magnetic field, very fast rotation, and it doesn't glitch much because it's too old, you know, it's already settled down. And these are the perfect guys for us. These are very good clocks, and that's what we are using. Each radio pulse, which we observe, is different in structure due to various reasons. One is the internal stru structure of the neutron star, another is propagation effects. But if you're averaging all these profiles, radio profiles of the pulses, you will get something extremely stable. So if you're averaging over this hour, next hour, next hour, this doesn't change. Each of them could be quite different. And this profile is used to, and, uh, to correlate with each individual and to estimate time of arrival. That's a key point. We want to estimate time of arrival of each pulse. Now, if you know the, and we do know period of the pulsar, we can predict arrival time of each pulse. And we can compare it, so the red one is predicted, let's say, no, whatever. Uh, let's say red is predicted and what is observed will be blue one. And we see the difference between what we predicted and what we observed. And that is what is called residuals in time of arrival. Okay? And there are several reasons why we expect that our prediction does not match the observation. I'll try to tell you some of them, and we need to model them. Um, so the residuals, they could look like this, like that, like that. So for instance, if you don't, did not estimate very well position of the pulsar on the sky, then all your residuals will, will be modulated by one year periodicity. It's because you think pulsar is there, but actually it's a little bit off. And you can actually adjust position of your pulsar to eliminate this. This is one of the way of measuring the position of the pulsar in the sky with even better accuracy than, by, than just triangulation. If you did not take into account that actually period of pulsar changes, so you need to take into account first and second derivative of the period of the pulsar. Of course, it's emitting uh, radio emission, probably other emissions, so it slows down the energy extracted from its uh, spin. So if you don't take into account, you have residuals of this form. So you have to take it into account. If you did not take into account proper motion of the pulsar, so it, it moves somewhere somehow, then you will have residuals of this form. So you need to take into account 
many of these factors in order to have residuals of this form like a white noise a bit. In addition, um, radio signal propagates in interstellar medium. So it means there is a gas between us and the pulsar. Moreover, it's not the same gas. So first of all, uh, uh, Earth, well, the radio telescopes moves around Sun. So you see pulsar with different angles. So the radio pulse coming through the different interstellar medium. In addition, pulsar moves itself. We're moving in a galactic plane, etc., etc. So there are variations in dispersion, time-dependent variations in dispersion. Too much. And you construct the model which takes into account all these effects in order to predict where, uh, sorry, not where, when each pulse should arrive. And this should take into account period of pulsar and its first, second derivative, so it changes in time. You need to take into account that uh, difference between the uh, clock which is used and the radio telescope and uh, terrestrial standards. Then if you have several radio telescopes, you probably want to reduce all these observations to solar system body center, take into account all relativistic effects. You want to take into account this dispersion measurement. It's not only constant, but actually it's time dependent. You need to take into account what is else? Yes. Uh, Doppler motion, so it's a relative uh, motion of the pulsar and uh, and a, a radio telescope plus gravitational redshift caused by sun and planets or, as I said, millisecond pulses quite often in the binary system, so a redshift due to its companion. You need to take into account Shapiro delay, this extra time which is taken due to propagation of electromagnetic field in the curved space time. So, as I said, again, in the binary system there will be companion and quite often it's not negligible companion, it's uh, at least solar mass, sometimes larger. So the space-time is curved, and there is a delay due to that. Now you took everything into account, and you're saying, well, now my model is complicated. I have this prediction for time of arrival, this time of observation of time of arrival, and I take residuals which are, to the best of my knowledge, should contain only noise. Of course, there is noise in the radiometer. There is noise in the pulsar. Hopefully, very small errors because I cannot determine these parameters to absolute accuracy. So there are some more errors still exist, and due to gravitational wave. Is it clear? Good. Um, now I already discussed this uh, this parameter omega l. If you remember, we had talked about this during uh, when I was talking about LIGO Virgo that it's uh, much less than one, which means gravitational wavelengths much larger than size of your instrument. Then uh, omega L comparable to one in case of LISA, but for LISA, so you can ask a bit different question actually. You can say this epsilon, okay, which is omega L basically here, I restored speed of light. Um, at which frequency it is equal to one? And you will see that the LIGO is 12, 12 kilohertz. It means that it's always true. For LISA, it is 50 millihertz. It's inside the band. So it's uh, some frequencies in the LISA are long wavelengths, some of them comparable. And in case of PTA, it's uh, 0 0.02 nanohertz. So for, for PTA, it's opposite. Uh, which, yeah. So, gravitational wavelengths always much shorter, significantly shorter than the size of your device. Size of your device is basically distance between Earth and the pulsar. Okay. And for those systems, we have to use the formula which we have derived already. This. Uh, did not assume anything about omega L, and we use this in the case of LISA already. So nothing new. But instead of just delta nu to be fluctuations or change in the frequency of your laser, now delta nu is a fluctuations in the frequency of arrival of your pulses. Okay? And so the frequency of the laser, you have frequency of ticks and tacks in your data, roughly speaking. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. 
And delta H is uh, this expression, it's again, H at the time of emission of radio signal, minus H, which is the gravitational wave signal, at time of observation on the Earth. The big difference is, in case of LISA, it was eight seconds, this time difference. In case of pulsar timing array, the distance is a few kiloparsec, which means distance, uh, the light travel time could be around 10,000 years. So, in other words, this term is sometimes called Earth term because it's a time of observation of the Earth, and this term called pulsar term. So, first of all, the pulsar term depends on the distance to the pulsar. So, it's uh, different for each pulsar. This term, it will be the same for all pulsars. It does not carry any information about pulsars. And this completely coherent term from each observation of different pulsars. You observe 40 pulsars, and it will be the same contribution for each of them. This term is, has different contribution, so it's non-coherent term. It's not the same term for each pulsar observation. And this is also um, this uh, factor, geometrical factor, n is the direction to the pulsar, K is direction of propagation of gravitational wave. And if gravitational wave signal, sorry, sorry, behind pulsar, the whole response is completely equal to zero exactly. So that's what's called sometimes uh, that uh, radio pulse surfing the gravitational wave. So number of uh, blue and red shifts, they basically cancel out. In, uh, another way to look at this difference, so this earth term, term and pulsar term, we are looking at the, first of all, the sources which are very broad, but I will talk about this. Let's look at the binary source, so just HIJ is this signal, it is cartoonish. The earth term corresponds to this part of the signal, and the pulsar term corresponds to this part of the signal. So we see different parts of the gravitational wave signal which are separated by thousand years in its orbital evolution. Um, these radio telescopes, I think it's, you can skip this, this square kilometer array. Um, how to improve the sensitivity of this pulsar timing array? First of all, you want to have more pulsars, good pulsars. Then your sensitivity scales as a root square of number of pulsars, just n measurements. Then if you have better device, then you can, um, the strength of your radio pulse increasing. If you have strong pulse, it means you can measure time of arrival more accurately. It means that you are timing much better. So there are two ways, one improving instruments and second by um, have more pulses. Now I want to say a few words about the sources. One of the, because I like binaries, I have to say about the start with the binaries, okay? So the, oh sorry, I'm running over the time. Do, do, can you let me finish, it's really two slides and I'm done. Okay, thank you. Um, binary sources. Those are supermassive black holes in the local universe. But it's not the same, it's almost the same things as uh, for LISA, but at the orbit with period of years. So they were very broad orbits. And because of energy release at such broad orbits is uh, tiny, the signal which we see is monochromatic. Over 20 years of observation is still monochromatic. But monochromatic, but frequency of pulsar and earth term will be different because they separated by 1,000 years in orbital evolution. You see? So this term will be monochromatic, this also, but it's, uh, the signal contains of two parts. You need to understand that. If I place, uh, just take astrophysical population of the binary black holes, supermassive black holes in the local universe, each of them will be dot because they're monochromatic. This frequency, this amplitude of gravitational wave uh, signal. I will sum up them and I will get this uh, blue curve. And this blue curve could be decomposed in two parts. The smooth component, it will be stochastic gravitational wave signal from the superposition of many, 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 many monochromatic signals. And occasionally, if I have source nearby, I will have this uh, spike. So it means monochromatic signal on top of the stochastic one from the source, which is rather close or more massive. So I might be able, to, I might want to search for stochastic signal and uh, um, monochromatic signal. Other sources, of course, of cosmological origin. Um, the 
this signal spans everywhere from um, what the people trying to measure with CMB polarization uh, and uh, up to frequency of, of LIGO. And here is a try attempt to measure the also stochastic gravitational signal from early universe in nanohertz band. The key point, and I think I will stop, yeah, I'll stop here after that, is, uh, is the following. For stochastic gravitational wave signal, it's a noise-like source, okay? In your deviation, in the, your residuals, it's a stochastic process. Your residuals are random. But there is an element of randomness which are common to all pulsars. So if you correlate the data pairwise from this pulsar residuals and from this pulsar, you correlate, and the, they'll be correlated part due to gravitational wave signal. And it's not only correlated, but it's correlated in a certain way. So if your stochastic gravitational wave signal is isotropic, then correlation between pairwise of the, uh, the signals depends only on the angular distance between the pulsars. So if you try to correlate data, pulsar data, from this pulsar with this pulsar, then from that, from that, and you start pu pu putting points on this uh, correlation, you compute correlations uh, versus angular distance between the pulsars, you will get, uh, you, they should lie near this curve, which is called Helling's Downs curve. It's very intrinsic to gravitational wave signal. And that's the signature which we are looking. And uh, let me just say a few words at the end. Um, this is just the beginning of gravitational wave astronomy, OK? Uh, I'm not that old, but I know it, it's really yours. Because uh, I hope to see a little bit, but for instance, Lisa, it will be 2000. Data taking properly will be 2035. So I will be probably on the age of retirement. And so it is your mission, it's your data. This, the gravitational wave in PTA is not detected, and not because there is no gravitational wave signal. It's definitely it's there. It's just integration time. So the period of the gravitational wave signal is at years, OK? So in order to integrate these signals, you need to have 30, 40 years of observations. At the moment, we have 20. Again, it's yours. So. It might be quite exciting uh, time for you. Uh, I hope to see a part of it as well, but nevertheless. And I also want to thank organizers for inviting me. And uh, it's a great opportunity and a great experience. And it's a great organization. And I want to thank all of you um, for being here and uh, for very helpful and stimulating discussion and your questions. Thank you very much.